So I wanted to talk about something that in the past and typically has made me quite happy, quite excited, quite intrigued, quite motivated to study. And that's these ideas of openness, of freedom, and geekiness. Uh, I am a geek and a nerd. I think I first started using Linux back in 1993, probably wrote my first web page back then as well. And I've long been a participant in these communities that we often speak of as open and free. However, there's also a couple of things that make me a little bit sad about those communities, and in particular, the gender gap. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today. But since I've used these terms, open and free and geek, I think it merits some discussion about what they mean. Because it's not that they have a technical meaning so much, but they do mean specific things to the communities that I study. And you might think, actually, some of the distinctions I'm, I, I'm drawing are kind of ridiculous and very fine, but to the people in these communities, they mean a lot. So I want to say a little bit about what these terms mean. So let's start with free software. Free software is basically software that you can copy, that you can modify, you can look at the source code, you can make those changes, and you can share those changes with other people. And basically, uh, the father of the free software movement is this gentleman here, Richard Stallman, when he was a little bit younger. And in the 80s, at the MIT Lab for Computer Science, where I once worked, and we would sometimes talk to one another in the hallway, he was sort of the hacker exemplar, you know, sleeping in the lab for days on end, just coding. He, he's written a number of really important pieces of software, one of which is called the Emacs Text Editor, and among hackers, it has a lot of cred. It's extremely extensible. Hackers who use the Emacs text editor can read their email, they can browse the web, they can uh, manage their to-dos and tasks, basically do everything with it. But beyond the technical contributions he made as a hacker, he also made a significant legal innovation. Because he loved the hacker culture, but in the 80s, in the 80s he was coming to realize that there was an encroaching sort of commercialization. People were going off to start software companies and taking their code with them. Um, software was being used by the department that they didn't have access to. For instance, there's a story that there was a printer that had a bug in it, and he was just incensed that he couldn't access the source code to the printer and fix the bugs himself, and he instead was dependent upon the company. And so he said, we need to do something about this. And one of the things that he realized we could do as much as you can hack software, you know, make those modifications and changes, he was going to hack the copyright system. And he did that by creating something that people speak of as the GPL, GNU Public License. The GNU was the organization he created sort of to develop the software, and the Free Software Foundation was sort of the legal side of things that maintained this GPL. And what the GPL is, it says it's a, cop it's a copyright license that says if you download this software, and you make modifications to it, and you want to allow other people to use that software, whether you give it to them for free or sell it, you have to make the source code available to the person who you've passed the software on to. And it has to have the same copyright license applied. So it's, it's this reciprocity that's required. If you're going to benefit from this pool of free software, and you're going to make changes, and you want to release that software, other people need to be able to do the same thing with that software. Stallman prefers to talk about this as a type of reciprocity. People at Microsoft have sometimes called it cancerous or viral because they don't tend to like one another necessarily. But that's the basic idea. However, we also have this term open source. And free software was a very powerful idea. It was delivering some very useful infrastructure and software, but Stallman can be a bit rough around the edges. He's quite ideological. He's very passionate about this idea of freedom. In fact, if you were to invite him to come and give a talk and ask him to speak about Linux, he would probably refuse because he wants the focus to be on free and freedom and free software foundation. He doesn't want any of this other sort of stuff contaminating what he might have to talk about. And so there were folks like Bruce Perrins and Eric Raymond who said, maybe we could put a prettier face on this movement. And in particular, the thing that they were intrigued was, is while Stallman focuses on the ideology of freedom, 
there's also a way that you can look at the process and say, oh, look, these people are working in the open. Because it's in the open and because people can look at the source code, they can find software bugs really easily. People can take the software and use it for their own purposes. And so this type of software can actually be used by people wearing suits for actual sort of pragmatic efficiency. And so they said, why don't we call this open source? We'll sort of leave the ideological battles on the side, and we'll try to sell this to companies actually to use that. And they were quite successful. But this caused sort of a problem, because now we have two terms out there. We have free software and open source. What's the difference? There's really not that much of a difference. It's really just sort of a matter of ideology and focus and packaging. And the whole idea of free software is kind of problematic itself. Because if I said, oh, I downloaded something free off the internet, a lot of people have downloaded freeware, right? You download the little application, you can use it for free. Maybe it'll nag you somewhere and it's nagware. But for someone like Salman, yes, you downloaded it for free, for gratis, but it's still not free software on the capital F sense. You can't modify the code, you can't make changes, you can't improve it, and you can't pass those on to other people. So there were some Europeans in particular who said, why don't we come up with a new term, Libre? And that'll help us get away from all this confusion about openness and freedom and free as in beer and free as in freedom and gratis. Didn't really kind of take. So unfortunately, the, the position we're in now is very often people just speak in these acronyms, FLOS or FOS. And that's what people talk about a lot. And so this idea of freedom that I've spoken about, this is what it mean, means in this kind of technical sense. Now the other thing that's happened is all of this, up, this stuff I've spoken about so far was about software. And then two interesting things happened. One, Wikipedia came on the scene. Right? And so people said, well, maybe this idea can apply to things beyond software. Because Wikipedia is prose, it's images, it's audio, it's video. And something else happened, which was an attempt by Congress that succeeded to extend copyright. Because in the United States, historically, as provided by the U.S. Constitution, copyright is a limited monopoly to copy and reproduce works. And the idea there is that if we give the author this limited monopoly, they will be incented to produce works. And people can use those works, and eventually they'll return back into the public domain. However, a number of people have works that they would like to have a perpetual copyright upon. For instance, People will often talk about Mickey Mouse, Mickey Mouse and Disney. And so every 10, 20 years, Congress extends the limits, the duration of copyright, another 10 or 20 years. So law professor Lawrence Lessig at Harvard and then at Stanford, now back at Harvard, argued before the Supreme Court with a number of other people to say this is actually unconstitutional for Congress to keep extending copyright because this the Constitution specifies a limited duration for a reason. You know? And in what way could you possibly incenting people to create more work for works that are already created and the authors are long dead? So he argued this before the Supreme Court and he lost. The Supreme Court said, this is within Congress's purview. If they want to keep extending copyright every 20 years, that's their business. And so what Lessig did is he said, Maybe I can learn a lesson from Stalin. And if I can't sort of fix the law, we can hack the law to fix a problem that the law is causing. And that problem was, is very often because everything is copyrighted. And for instance, I use some images in my slide deck today. And if I had to contact each one of the authors of those images and ask for their explicit permission, I would have had to contact them and probably never gotten good answers. Um, and it's unfortunate because there's a lot of stuff out there that people could use if they only knew they could use it and have those permissions. So Leslie created something called Creative Commons with a no number of other people. And basically they said, much like the GPL is a copyright license that allows people to interact freely with software content, why don't we create some nice licenses called Creative Commons licenses that allow people to do the same with all other types of content. So for instance, Wikipedia is under a Creative Commons license now. Lots of blogs is under a Creative Commons license. My book about Wikipedia is available online under a Creative Commons license. 
And that means it reduces a lot of the friction that the broken copyright system presently puts upon people who would like to collaborate. So the term that Leslie gave for this, and he published a very famous book, was free culture. So now we speak about free culture. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. I will certainly be talking about anecdotes from the software world, but I'm also going to be talking about Wikipedia, and this is within this larger umbrella of free culture. The final thing I'm going to talk about are geeks. As I said, I'm a self-identifying nerd and a geek. Um, and basically, now people speak of a geek chic. Maybe it's not as bad as it used to be, being a geek. Um, I clean up pretty nicely. Uh, I'm wearing my nice shirt. And, but my usual days, I'm quite nerdy. I shaved for today, though I have my little bit of um, But basically, there are people that are enthusiastic and passionate about something. And there's reef geeks who are into aquariums. There's knitting geeks who are really into knitting. There's a park by my house where some people knit bombs the whole park. So there's cozies on the trees and just hanging everywhere, very cool. Um, but for the most part, I am talking about online communities and cultures, and this is sort of the geeks that I'm talking about. So, any questions about the terminology? Okay, so let me return to my earlier point. I wrote a book about Wikipedia. I'm very fond of Wikipedia, though I think it has some problems and challenges. And there's a lot of good stuff I feel like we get out of free culture. So for instance, if you haven't used these things yourself directly and personally, Linux and Apache, has anyone ever used Linux? Okay, a couple people, Apache, okay, that's good. So even if you haven't used it directly, you have used it indirectly when you're browsing the web, because a lot of the web servers online use this software. I think the web, I think the web is part of the free culture movement. The web browsers you use most likely have, if they're not completely free software, they have free software components within them. And Wikipedia, which I can easily waste a lot of time on, as many of you perhaps can. Uh, all this good stuff that I really appreciate having access to. So that's a good thing. However, when I started looking at this phenomenon, a lot of people, when they talked about free software and open source, they tended to focus upon the licenses. And I've talked about those licenses. It's important to understand. But I was also interested in these communities from a community sort of sociological perspective. Like, what does it mean for a community to be open? I'm going to talk about that. And so, you know, at first glance at least, I think we can say I really like these communities because you can look at the mailing lists and the archives and join the mailing lists and read their wikis, <coughs> join the groups, make contributions. It's not as if there's these horrible barriers that are impenetrable. Um, and so I think that's a good thing and I enjoy it. Typically the communities are meritocratic. So if you bring your game and you make a really significant contribution, you can be recognized in the community. Even more interestingly, if the community dynamics are not to your liking, like if you think there's a jerk that's heading up the community or you think the community is really uncivil, you can take the thing that they're working on and fork it and take it somewhere else and create your own community working on the same thing. So for example, has anyone ever heard of Citizendium? Just a few people. One of the disaffected co-founders of Wikipedia, Larry Sanger, actually said, I think the culture of Wikipedia has become overly anarchistic. And there's a lot of crazies kind of running the place. And I'm going to go and create an alternative encyclopedia using some of the content from Wikipedia, but make a couple of changes. For instance, I'm going to require everyone to use their real name. I'm going to have everyone defer to the authority of experts, people with PhDs. And he tried to create an alternative to uh, Wikipedia called Citizenium that wasn't terribly successful. It's kind of interesting to talk about why it wasn't successful. But this, too, is a good sort of social <coughs> phenomena related to these communities. And finally, if you're a nerd and a geek, it can be fun to hang out with other nerds and geeks. Um, and so I enjoy these communities for those reasons. However, I think, and what I'm going to talk about today, there's some things that I've come to lament about these communities. And first and foremost, just some basic numbers, I think the gender gap, the fact that there are so few women in these communities. So for example, and these, these figures differ depending on when you look in, you know, in the West or in the United States. But if you look at the number of 
women participating in computing related professional fields, it's around 27%. And it was higher in the 80s, it was actually up in the 30%, like 35, 36%, but now it's about 27%. And you could say, no, that's unfortunate, we would like to have more parity. However, the thing that really sort of puzzled me is, when, well, if we take that computing culture and we add all this really good stuff on top of it, freedom and opus, openness and meritocracy and geeks and nerds, this number would probably go up, right? Wrong. It drops precipitously, right? And so among free and open source software developers, we're talking like 1% women contributors. And even if you were a gender essentialist and you said, well, okay, guys are good at math and computers, women are good at social interaction and writing, then you might expect, okay, Wikipedia is where we would have the parody. And I'm not saying I am a gender essentialist in that way, but even if you were to make that argument, you'd, I would expect to see more women at Wikipedia. And in fact, again, depending on the survey, we're talking about 9% to 13%. So that's my puzzle, that's my quandary that I'm going to talk about. And I want to mention a couple of other ideas because I think it's related to the problem in, in the free culture world. But I don't want to say that these problems are unique to the free culture world. I'm going to talk briefly by, about what I mean when I say androcentrism, sexism, and misogyny. These are problems that are problems for online culture in general, and they just manifest in this free culture community as well because so much of what happens there is online. So basically, androcentrism is assuming that your audience are men. And given the historical patterns in these communities, it's an assumption that that's not that far off target. But if we wish to change that fact, and we want to see more women participating, continuing to assume the fact that your audience is all men, and you make do jokes, and you kind of speak in that particular way, you're not really helping the situation. So, I'm going to talk about a couple of examples. I'm not saying these people are evil or horrible or sexist even. I'm just saying I do think it's androcentric and it can be problematic. So here's an example from Mark Shuttleworth. Mark Shuttleworth is a very wealthy man who made a lot of money in the software world. Um, he spent some of that money by becoming a private cosmonaut. He sat on top of a Soviet rocket. He's one of these millionaire astronauts that paid the Soviets to send him up into space. Something else he did is he created uh, a company and a movement called Ubuntu. And that's the type of Linux distribution I actually use. Because Linux itself is the operating system kernel, but there's lots of other tools and applications and desktops around that. So if you actually want to use Linux, you kind of need the larger package, the larger distribution. And the Ubuntu distribution is intended to be the whole thing in a very easy, accessible, interoperable package. And so in 2009, he was given a talk, and he said a couple of things that I want to read. He said, a release, and Ubuntu does two releases every year, is an amazing thing. I'm not talking about the happy ending. So a little bit of sexual innuendo there. He was also talking about, you know, Ubuntu should be interoperable. It should be easy to plug your printer in. And when he talks about that, he says, your printer, your mom's printer, your grandmother's printer. So this is the sort of typical way where we always say, you know, you have to help your mom and your grandma with the computer, even if she's a whiz with the computer and it's your dad that's having the problem, right? And then he said, you know, if we are successful, we make this simple. Everyone's always wondering and asking what it is you do for a living, and you'll be able to explain to girls what it is you do. So not horrible, not evil, but a number of women in particular and men said this kind of language is problematic. Richard Stallman, who I already mentioned, the father of free software, I mentioned he made this amazing text editor application, Emacs. And since doing that, when he gives a presentation, he often does an odd little skit. And he'll dress up as what he calls St. Ignatius, and he'll talk about the cult or the Emacs church. And again, in 2009, he was quoted saying this. He says, and we have the cult of the Virgin of Emacs. The Virgin of Emacs is is any female who has not yet learned how to use Emacs. And in the Church of Emacs, we believe that taking her Emacs virginity away is a blessed act. So again, an attempt at humor with some sexual innuendo, but a lot of people said, this is not healthy. Right? So these are just some of the examples of the androcentrism in free culture movement. 
not that it's unique to the free culture movement. Then we have sexism. So the discussions about androcentrism in the free culture movement then prompts lots of discourse. You're overreacting, this is an important issue, and anonymous coward is the term we use in online communities who people you know, who comment don't sign their name. And here we can see an anonymous coward. Blah, 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 this kind of whining bullshit about unimportant details is exactly why women should be left out in the cold. Again, this was said in the context of the free culture movement um, by an anonymous coward in response to the discussions about androcentrism, and this is unfortunate. But it can get worse than that, because my understanding of sexism is that you're saying the one set of people are less than you and shouldn't be able to participate, whereas the misogyny is actually hateful towards a particular group of people. So here we see a comment by saying, you know what, you evil feminists, I hope you go to a country or your country turns into the sort of place where feminists are killed. And this is the sort of comment you might find online. Uh, my next book project, actually, the working title now is called Comment Culture, Likers, Haters, and Manipulators in the Age of the Web. So I'm really interested in the cultures around comment and anonymous cowards and likes and hates and all that kind of stuff, quite interesting. But again, the gender gap, the androcentrism, the sexism, the misogyny leads me to this question of well, why does adding this element of freedom create this problem? And could it create the problem? So just as people in the past would talk about, we're talking about freeze and freedom, not freeze and beer, I want to ask the question, could we also be talking about freeze and sexist question, right? And so there's three pieces of this puzzle that I think permit me to make this argument maybe as free as in sexist. The first is the geek identity, and I'm going to talk about the, the identity of the geekness as well as sort of the discursive behavior of the geek. As noted, I think the openness of these communities uh, can be problematic, and that the very idea and rhetoric of freedom is also problematic. I'm going to talk about each one of those in turn. So on being a geek, as typically understood, there is a geek stereotype. It's the young white guy who loves computers and anime and online gaming, and he can be fairly argumentative. Right? And as an example of this, I can think of no one better than comic book guy from The Simpsons. And if you're unfamiliar, I brought a little clip for you. Last night's scratchy was without a doubt the worst episode ever. Rest assured that I was on the internet within minutes registering my disgust throughout the world. Right. So he has no problem expressing his, his opinion, right, in a very sort of sharp way for the benefit of people using the internet all over the world. And I'm going to digress a little bit, but you'll note that the comic book guy kind of had a, a scraggly beard. Um, and one of my favorite derogatory terms for nerds are neck beards. <laughs> and these are people you know, are really scraggly. They're not even willing to kind of shave here. It just goes kind of crazy down here. And again, I'm a nerd. I shaved for today. Uh, not that I could grow a neck beard even if I wanted. I am stuck with it, so it'll go tea. Um, but the, the, pres the meaning and presence of, of the beard in geek culture kind of has an interesting history and, and meaning. Uh, when I used to do internet standards and computer standards and web standards, uh, back then, I would very easily, freely, and critically talk about oh, the old beards, because I would be in working groups and we're talking about standards for the internet. And the, the guys that invented the internet, and for the most part it was guys, but there were also some important women, had these nice big beards that were turning gray, so we talked about them as the gray beards. And again, this seems kind of trivial, but just two weeks ago I saw something and I was like, oh, this is going to be perfect for the talk. So this is an employment sort of service of mine. They take resumes from developers, and they take sort of job wanted solicitations for people who need developers, and they put the two together. And on their ad, they said, this is the sort of guy that we provide, a bearded experience. Our hackers really know their thing, right? Again, it's not horrible, but I don't think it's helping. And in fact, a number of people said this, and this is my favorite from Julie <coughs> Hogan, she said, Looks like I'm going to have to upgrade. I guess my mustache isn't enough to be man people anymore. And I love this term, man people, uh, because it's like, oh, 
you don't even, you don't even get to count. You don't even have any sort of visibility unless you do have the facial hair. Um, so all this is just to say the identity of the geekness, as typically sort of constructed and understood, can be kind of problematic. And I'm not the first person to notice this. People who have studied this have, you know, identified this as an issue for decades. We can go back to Sherry Turkle in the 1980s, who, when she spoke, about, spoke to women about wanting to you know, maybe pursue a career in computer science, they would express what Turkle called a, a, a reticence, a computational reticence, that the people that they saw pursuing computer science were almost intimate with the computers. You know, they would be in the labs 24 hours a day, and it was like this culture of macho-ness and competition and violence, and it just was not appealing to them. A number of years later, uh, Rasmussen and Habness again talked to, to young people about their interest in pursuing computer-related professions, and there, the women they interviewed would talk about computing profession almost being scary and frightening, and they didn't want to be a key presser. These people were overly obsessive and monomaniacal. And more recently, Mark Willis and Fisher had this really nice book on a, on a topic. And when they would survey young people, both men and women, uh, they found that a lot of people found computer science to be insular and isolating, and two-thirds of the women expressed a disinterest <coughs> say that's kind of alienating, as well as a third of the men. So a lot of the characterizations I'm making today, you can find both men and women holding those opinions and feelings about geek identity and geek culture and computer culture. It's just that more women tend to feel that way, and I think women are more especially alienated from some of this behavior. And a study really quite recently um, on this so interesting. So it was an experimental study, and they'd have people come into a classroom, much like this one, and they would survey them about their career interests and ask them, would you be interested in pursuing a career in computer science or in computers? And when they included a couple of Star Trek posters on the wall, it significantly depressed the expressed interest of young women in pursuing computing-related professions. And I say this because when I had my office at MIT's lab for computer science, I had my big monitor before I had a nice thin LCD. I had Star Trek toys <laughs> all across the top of my monitor. And little did I know that maybe I'm alienating uh, people that might have been interested in the career. And this is, I'll, I'll note, one of the difficulties in talking about this topic. Because I'm saying if you like Star Trek, you're not an evil sexist person. I like Star Trek. Um, it's just that this identity the narrowness with which it has been defined historically and understood has come to be a proxy for things that can be alienating to people, especially women. That's the identity. But as we saw with the comic book guy, the actual sort of discursive behavior, the, the, the way that people perceive merit, the way they value interactions, in these communities, it's a kind of macho, harsh, I can argue you down, I can, sh you know, outshout you, um, I can overwhelm you by you know, just sending you thousands and thousands of emails with lots of detail. And so, for instance, uh, Val Aurora, in her really nice document, she's been involved in Linux for a long time, she has a how to encourage women in Linux. She noted that, you know, women have been socialized. This is sort of one of those double binds of you're supposed to be polite and nice and sociable, and if you go to this space and you behave that way, you're going to be ignored. And of course, the double bind is if you don't behave that way, if you are pushy, then you're labeled the bitch. In geek culture, this is also problematic because a number of women have reported that, you know, by becoming geek, they feel alienated from some of their female peers, but they're never geek enough for the male geeks anyway. So they're kind of in this no woman zone between these two places, and it's not a very comfortable place to be. Similarly, while Wikipedia is focused on prose and not code, I think that culture of argumentation, of being super focused and detailed, and just overwhelming someone with your own speech is quite common in Wikipedia, and it's been characterized in this way as fighty. And again, to give you an example of this, I'm going to show another clip from The Simpsons. In episode 
209 when he can play scratchy skeleton like a xylophone. He strikes the same riff twice in succession, yet he produces two clearly different tones. I mean, what are we to believe that this is some sort of a, a magic xylophone or something? Boy, I really hope somebody got fired for that one. So, for normal people, that's a trivial, trivial detail. But for this guy, that's a firing offense, right? And so, this is kind of what you can bump into in these worlds. So that's the geek part, right? The identity and the discursive sort of behavior and performance. So let's talk about openness now. And the scholar that really informed my thinking on this was talking about communities, you know, that well before the web and free software. And here Joe Freeman was a participant in a number of feminist collectives in the late 1960s and early 1970s. And these communities were trying to get rid of traditional structure, hierarchy, patriarchy, making things very decentralized and democratic. And the insight that Freeman had was when you get rid of sort of the formal roles of office, the treasurer and the president and the vice president, that try to get rid of the structure and the hierarchy, new structures nonetheless manifested, but they were informal and implicit. So in her case, she found you know, some women forming powerful cliques around themselves. And the bad thing about this, the irony, is that these particular powerful people had no accountability because they weren't elected positions anyway. And she, she characterized this as the tyranny of structuralism. And so when I think about openness, we should take that way of thinking and bring it to the current uh, scenario in that when we say a community is open, you know, it's open to everyone, some of the people that we're also being open to are what in the computing and free culture movement have been, we'll talk about as toxic people, poison apples, uh, bad apples, prima donnas, and here again, I'm quoting Valerie, who's saying, you know, if you had a group with nine really helpful, friendly, welcoming people, but you still have that one obnoxious jerk, you're going to chase people away. And you just have to sort of appreciate that. And maybe there's things we can do about that. Carla Schroeder, another prominent woman, uh, she was the editor of Linux uh, publication. Noted again, even if you have this brilliant person, and in the tech discourse, we talk about this as the prima donna, you have this typically guy on your staff or in your community who can just outcode anyone nine ways to Sunday, but he's a real jerk. And is it worth keeping this person around for their skill if socially they're alienating everyone around them? So this is the problem. And the thing even with the poison people, the toxic people, the bad apples, is at least they mean well. You know, they might be rough around the edges, but they're not really there to alienate people, they just care about the code. But there's also lots of people that join these communities in bad faith. There's trolls, there's anonymous cowards. So for example, again, here's some quotes from anonymous cowards about discussions resulting from uh, the instances of androcentrism. Uh, look at me, I'm an attention whore, and, and the like. And something that uh, Carla has noted, and I don't think this will be surprising to anyone really, is that women get targeted in special and icky ways just for being women. And again, this isn't unique to the free culture world. I think this is a feature of comment culture online today. Uh, and just to give you an example, it, it doesn't seem to matter what is being argued about. If there's a woman involved, they're going to go for her appearance or her sexual history. That's just where the conversation goes, it seems, no matter what. When I published my book about Wikipedia, Generally, I was quite favorable of Wikipedia that was trying to be scholarly and frame it in a historical context. But people, for instance, saw me as being in cahoots with the powers that be at Wikipedia. And there are discussion boards of Wikipedia haters, as there are discussion boards of haters for everything pretty much out there, where they just kind of stalk people and publish lots of details about people. And so as sort of an attack on me for being nice to Wikipedia, they found pictures of me and put them in these comic book kind of panels and put pictures of penises all around me that were actually sourced from Wikimedia Commons. So they were free, free culture penises. Um, 
and implied that I was homosexual and as if that was an attack. Um, and all of it, the attention and the penises and all that was like, it freaked me out. But had I been a woman, I think it would have freaked me out more, rightfully so. And I think they would have even been more vicious. So, yes, unfortunate, creepy, and weird. So, this is what happens seemingly when we have open communities. Because going back to Freeman, let me repeat what she said again. She said, structurelessness is organizationally impossible. So I wonder if I could then take freedom and Freeman and phrase it as, Openness is organizationally impossible. We cannot decide whether to have an open or unopen group, only to whom we will be open to. So that's my thinking about openness. Now finally, ideology. The rhetoric and idea of freedom itself. So again, stupid comment. And the scholar here that really influenced me is Susan Herring. And she's been studying online communities and the discourse on mailing lists from the 90s for a long time now. And well before you know, free culture was really in anyone's mind, she found this really interesting phenomenon that men typically dominated the conversation, they just roll over other people. And if anyone said, dude, you know, calm down, maybe be a little kinder in your comments, these guys would puff up and say, how dare you say that to me? The internet is all about free speech and you're trying to censor me. And so, Herring characterized this as a sort of adversarial sort of conception of freedom where their notion of freedom was really about enforcing this idea of the primacy of free speech, and a very sort of libertarian notion of free speech. Where, and if you weren't really willing to come and to do battle, you were thought to be not really worthwhile and they could just flame you into oblivion and hopefully you would leave. And what she said in 1994, like when I read this, I was like, oh, this is so amazing and perfect. She said this anarchic self-determination and vigorous debate ethic is remarkably preserved in 1994. And I thought, wow, free software 20 years later, that's kind of what it's all about is freedom, 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 free as in freedom. And so, just to give you an example of how this notion of freedom and sort of this libertarian ethic exists and continues today, I want to talk about some of the founders of free culture, some really prominent people. And I really appreciate what all of these men have done. I have personally benefited from everything, uh, and in many ways, from their significant contributions. And I'm not saying that these men are necessarily sexist, I'm certainly not. Um, but I am saying you can see this, this thread of this particular value of a very vigorous, discursive sort of valuation of freedom. So first, of course, we have Stallman, free as in freedom. If you're wondering what he's wearing, he's wearing his St. Ignatius hat. He's doing his, his cult of Emacs shtick up on stage. And He's a very different creature politically from some of the other people I'm going to talk about, but nonetheless, there's this idea of freedom. Eric Raymond, gentleman here, he's one of the guys that actually came along and said, maybe we need open source. But Raymond politically, philosophically, is very classical American libertarianism. His blog is entitled Armed and Dangerous because he's both very st strongly um, heartfelt libertarian, but also a Second Amendment gun rights sort of person. It's a very sort of classical American in that sense. We also have Mark Shuttleworth, who I mentioned, who started the Ubuntu distribution. And he too, if you look into some of the things that influenced him, he'll say, I was quite influenced and, and, and fond of Adam Smith's Invisible Hand and Ayn Rand's uh, Heroic Man. Indeed, Ayn Rand's objectivism, this particular type of philosophy that some people have characterized as being very popular with teenage boys, and in fact, I fancied Ayn Rand when I was younger, um, you know, very influential in internet culture. Similarly, Larry Sanger and Jimmy Wales, here Jimmy is the main founder of Wikipedia, met on an objectivist philosophy email list. Um, and it's said that he's named his daughter Kira after an Ayn Rand character. Um, so, there's nothing wrong with that. 
I'm just saying that this kind of approach to individualism, this sort of heroic, autonomous man who kind of forces and makes their way in the world and kind of out-argue anyone else, we can still see evidence of this in some of the important people within the movement. And so women in the free culture movement, including Carla Schroeder here, have said, is this the only conception of freedom we can have? So, for instance, Carla is saying, perhaps instead of talking about freedom as being the most unpleasant person that we could possibly be, we could also understand freedom as in freedom to be welcoming. So that's kind of the rhetoric of freedom. But I also think the very word freedom and openness as well can act as a sort of veil. And so when the discourse about Wikipedia's gender gap kind of reached the mainstream popular press in 2009, uh, I was already thinking about this. And I spoke to some interviews, and I wrote a little blurb in the New York Times relative to a Noam Cohn article. And some people you know, saw this discourse. And on the political correctness blog, watch blog, Someone wrote, the fact that Wikipedia is voluntary and open to all demonstrates that men and women have inherently different interests. Heather McDonald, writing on Slate, responding to me specifically, wrote, Wikipedia's gender imbalance is a non-problem in search of a misguided solution. And at this time, I received quite a lot of hate email, I mean, a mangina. Uh, <laughs> and the, the masculinist community is quite strong online, and they can be quite kind of rapid. I don't know if you've ever bumped into masking lists, but they can be a hoop. Um, and I, I want to be careful and say that I don't want to say that the gender balance at Wikipedia or any of these other communities has to be 50-50. Indeed, if you were to say, what should the gender balance be? I don't know. 50-50, 55, 65. Um, it's hard to say, but the thing that I'm interested in, and this comes from the thing that I've noticed, is that I think we can ask the question about why is there a gap and what's contributing <coughs> to the gap. And so if we think about this historically or comparatively, we do know, for instance, there were a lot more women in computer related professions in the 1980s, even in the West. We do know that there's a lot more women in the computing profession in Southeast Asia and some of the Arab countries. And in part, people who have studied this have said it's because their computing is not seen as a matter of identity and passion, but simply as a good way to get a job. Even if we look at Wikipedia, and we look at different Wikipedias in different countries, we can find a significant variance in the number of female contributors. And so we know it varies comparatively and historically. We know these figures can vary. So then the question is, why do they vary? And that's what I'm trying to address. So in conclusion, I want to conclude, to be redundant, with a quote from Kat Walsh. And Kat is someone I really respect. She's been an active Wikipedian for many years. A couple of years ago, she joined the board of the Wikimedia Foundation. In fact, now she's the chair of the board of the Wikimedia Foundation. So there's the staff, you know, the people that sit in the offices, and that's actually led by a woman. And now from the community point of view as well, the top Wikipedian is a woman. And when all of this conversation started and lasted for a couple of years about the Wikipedia gender gap, she said the following, and parts of this I really strongly agree with. And she said, I don't think the problem at Wikipedia and other free culture places so much is gender. The problem is that we have this fighty community. She says, it's a culture that rewards certain traits. And if we were able to change what we reward, if we were able to make Wikipedia a more open and diverse place in general, the gender problem would solve itself. And I'm all for making Wikipedia more open and diverse in general. But my concern with this quotation is that I don't believe that there's an in general yet when it comes to notions of geekiness, openness, and freedom. I've spoken some to the history and the stereotypical construction of these things. And so they're already burdened by particular sort of 
know, identity instead of value. And there is no in general yet because the traditional geek identity and discursive style can be unappealing, as I mentioned. Open communities are especially difficult to problematic people, be they sort of clueless, androcentric uh, mishaps, or sexist, anonymous cowards, or scary misogynists. And the ideas of freedom and openness, as I just discussed, can be used to rationalize and excuse the gender gap and just say, it's just a matter of choice. The fact that women can join a community, you know, there's no formal barrier, but the fact that there's somewhere there that's going to uh, alienate her or freak her out, well, that's not our concern. It's free and it's open, so therefore this simply reflects a matter of personal choice. So hence my, what I think we should do on all of these points is that I do think gender needs to be an explicit point of the conversation. I don't think we can assume in general yet. I think we should continue to challenge and expand uh, what it means to be a geek. And my favorite website uh, for this is Geek Feminism. Uh, some of the women I quote are very active there or started it. And there you can find, you know, discussions about everything I've talked about. I mean, this is one of the big sources of the materials that I rely upon. And that I think communities need to be cognizant of the challenges of openness. So, for example, some of the things that people have been working on are, for instance, codes of conduct or community guidelines. So, there's been a ridiculous amount of instances at conferences, both in the atheist world, in the geek world, in the fan world, in the free and open source culture world. Fortunately, I'm not aware of anything prominent happening in the Wikipedia world. But for example, at some technical conferences, men will give up and give presentations and basically have pornography on the slide or be making really crude jokes. And again, under that notion of, well, free speech, we're the conference organizers, but we don't control what the people on our panel say, the community, led by a lot of the women I've mentioned, have said, you know what, this is not cool. We don't have to take this anymore. So why don't we come up with some guidelines to say, we don't want explicit pornographic material in the presentations at the technical conference. And of course, some people said, oh, that's a violation of free speech. But for the most part, that argument seems not to be winning the day. People are turning towards saying, yeah, let's get rid of that. We don't need that. And if someone does that, we're going to boot them from the conference and not invite them back. And the Geek Feminism website is great, a more sort of um, specific advocacy organization that I'm quite fond of now, and I just joined the advisory board uh, last week, actually, is the ADA initiative. And so, for instance, they're one of the groups that have been drafting some of the uh, non-discriminatory boilerplate that conferences, technical conferences, can use, and doing lots of other good work at the ADA initiative. So with that said, again, thank you for coming. Uh, thank you for listening. And I welcome your questions and conversation.